GP views on implementing the cytosponge test in primary care. This is a discussion between two GPs. We're going to start by introducing ourselves. Over to you, Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Roop, and uh, for six years I was the Royal College of GPs uh, National Clinical Champion for Cancer, and I'm now uh, one of their clinical advisors and also work for CRUK as their lead GP. Great. And I'm Fiona Walter. I'm a GP by training. And for the last 10 years or more, I've been leading the primary care cancer research group in Cambridge in the Department of Public Health and Primary Care. And I have been working with Rebecca Fitzgerald and her team um, on this body of work that's led to the site of sponge for most of that time for about 10 years now. So this afternoon, we're going to start with a short presentation and then use some of the findings to go into a discussion between the two of us. So I'm going to start with the presentation and this is around clinician views on the acceptability of the cytosponge test for Barrett's esophagus. And this was a qualitative study that was embedded in the primary care randomized control trial. So just a little bit of background to start with. Um, for those of you who are less familiar with the, with the trial and the results, heartburn is a common symptom for um, patients to present to us GPs in primary care. It affects about 20% of the adult population and a small proportion of these individuals go on to develop esophageal adenocarcinoma. And this has a dreadful outlook. Um, less than 20% of patients survive for more than five years and only 30% um, have been diagnosed with early stage disease, which enables treatment with curative intent. But there is a precursor lesion known as Barrett's esophagus. It's often asymptomatic and it's underdiagnosed, but gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease, what we know as GERD or GORD, is the strongest risk factor. And about one in 20 people with reflux symptoms have Barrett's esophagus. So um, over the past decade, uh, Rebecca Fitzgerald and her team in Cambridge, and I've been somewhat included in, in this body of work, have developed um, evidence to show that a pill on a string, the cytosponge, which dissolves after swallowing and can then be pulled back up, um, impregnated with a biomarker called TFF3, um, can contribute to detecting um, esophageal cancer earlier by testing for Barrett's esophagus in primary care. So this is the front page of the uh, paper, which was published in The Lancet in August last year. And it gives the results of a large multi-center pragmatic randomized control trial. But importantly for us, this was set in primary care. Um, it was a huge trial, actually. Over 13,000 patients were uh, recruited from 109 practices across England. And this was over a two-year period. About 40% of patients in the intervention arm expressed an interest in taking part. And these were all patients who were aged 50 and over and who'd received at least six months of an antacid, um, anti, an, sorry, acid suppressant medication in the previous year and had no record of endoscopy for the last five years. So about 25% of these people who had expressed an interest attended for the cytosponge test. And in the end, there were 140 Barrett's esophagus diagnosed in the intervention arm compared with just 13 in the usual care arm, meaning that there was a um, ratio of about 10 times as many in the intervention arm. Um, so it's an important finding and there have been subsequent papers and um, analyses of data that we also collected around cost effectiveness and around acceptability to patients. But today I just want to share some very top level findings from an analysis looking at acceptability by clinicians who are involved in these practices. So before I do that, I think it's important to say, um, have a brief mention about the adverse effects that very few 
adverse effects were noticed during the trial. Up to under 10% of people reported mild side effects such as a sore throat requiring some treatment and uh, less than 1% had anything more serious than that, of which the most serious was a lost sponge which needed to be retrieved at endoscopy. So how can this cytosponge fit into clinical practice in primary care? Well, I think these results have shown us that it's very likely to be feasible during a primary care consultation. It's likely to be acceptable to patients. The current NICE guidance that we have on management and treatment of GORD is for symptomatic treatment. And therefore, the cytosponge can be a very useful tool for patients with new onset symptoms who are aged. Currently, the recommendation is for over 55, although the trial recruited people over 50 and who don't have the alarm symptom of dysphagia, which the guidance is that we uh, GPs need to make an urgent two week wait referral. Um, I must add that actually at the moment, there's no evidence yet for the effect of using cytosponge on stage at diagnosis. So we um, undertook a qualitative study to explore clinician acceptability. We interviewed GPs and nurses during the trial, and we asked them about their experiences and views about the test and about steps towards implementation. We recorded and transcribed verbatim all the interviews, and we did a thematic analysis underpinned by the theoretical framework of acceptability. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's, it's a little bit complex to look at, but you'll see that there's basically seven criteria which um, give a multifaceted um, examination of the extent to which people delivering or receiving a healthcare event intervention consider it to be appropriate and to be based on cognitive and emotional responses to the intervention. I'm very happy to give more advice to people who are interested in finding out more about the SECON framework. So the sample that we recruited were 15 GPs and 15 nurses. And you'll see that their mean age was between 49, 47. It's about the same with both groups. Uh, that uh, there were fairly equal, even numbers of men and women in the GPs, but the nurse group was all female. And that the groups as a whole had quite a lot of years of experience between them all. So I'm just going to give you some top level results. And can I just say at this point that these are as yet unpublished data, so please don't quote them. So when we asked the GPs about what they thought about Cytosponge, they were really very um, supportive, saying they liked the way it was so easy to use. Um, although they hadn't actually been doing the tests themselves, these have been entirely done by either practice nurses or clinical research nurses. They gauged the um, acceptability of this by the patients they talked to having had the cytosponge test. And they were very gratified to hear that most patients seemed to be willing to repeat the test. And they thought, as in the second quote, that spoke volumes really. They also very much um, uh, valued the fact that care could be given nearer to home and that using the cytosponge stopped um, unnecessary amount of patients having to go to secondary care for their tests. The nurses also really liked the fact that the cytosponge could be delivered close to home, but they had more anxiety about burden for patients. Some of them said that patients had been pretty anxious when they appeared for the cytosponge test because it was uh, relatively unknown. They hadn't been able to ask friends and relatives about it. And a few of their patients had had difficulties swallowing. And there's this quote about the fact that the cytosponge needs the string bunched and put at the back of the throat. Sometimes this was a little difficult to get down. So then turning to clinical need and safety, both GPs and nurses talked extensively about the value of um, of the cytosponge once effectiveness and cost effectiveness had been established for patients presenting particularly new onset um, with new onset heartburn. Some of the nurses were more concerned about safety, about the safety of using the cytosponge itself in primary care setting, um, and also the safety of the patient, both in terms of not getting too anxious before they had it, um, and being safely returned to home to recover after having had this test done. So um, we've been drawing together some of these findings into some key areas um, which really relate to future implementation of cytosponge into routine clinical care. 
And these um, partly are around these safety concerns that I've already mentioned. I'm just going to read you out a few quotes just to give you an example for each of these headings. So one GP said, people won't like the idea of it. People don't do cervical cancer screening or mammograms as much as others. The turnout rate, for instance, for fit testing for the bowel cancer screening is quite poor. It's only about 60%. And actually, this GP thought that's a much easier test to do than to swallow a capsule. So that's something I want to discuss with, with Richard in a minute. Um, then, the, And that really covers the point about engagement with patients as well as tests in the community. There was a great deal of concern, particularly from the GPs, about the costs of delivering the test in primary care, not just the actual monetary cost, but also the cost in terms of time and capacity and burden on primary care. Um, and so one, one of the um, interviewees said, in primary care, we're facing an increase in workload that's come out of hospitals, so the capacity is maxed out. If we would take on, take on something like this in primary care, we'd need to know where the staff are coming from to do it, and if we're then responsible for employing the staff, and then where's the funding coming from? Both doctors and nurses talked a great deal about um, the fact that the implementing might be much easier if we were to organise um, primary care into delivering special clinics and teamwork. And so an example of that is um, someone saying, you'd need someone doing it regularly, I think, in a clinic setting, which would get over some of the logistic issues. We're working to scale and we're working in networks and alliances, so I don't foresee there's a huge problem. But I don't see it happening in the middle of a Monday morning surgery. You know, that's not going to be feasible. It would have to be booked on a book clinic, perhaps booked online. And then, yes, I think it would be um, a practice nurse delivering it sort of thing. And then the final area that people talked a great deal about was how um, primary care could maintain, not only um, get trained in, in um, undertaking the cytosponge test, but also how to maintain competency and run the sorts of processes that were necessary. So my final quote is from um, an interviewee who said, it might be much more suitable to deliver in hubs than in individual practices because you need a degree of specialization in this sort of thing. I know our nurse who, who did it, they said they were on a learning curve. They were quite proficient by the time they came, but it had taken a while to get used to the procedure. And in fact, they described it took up to about 10 procedures before they felt absolutely confident. So there will be an issue for nurses in terms of how they'll maintain that level of skill. So that's enough quotes for now. Before we go on, I'd just like to acknowledge the team who took part in this study, and particularly the primary care practices and the patients who contributed to, um, to such a huge trial. So over to Richard. Here are these areas for discussion, and I might turn off the slides now, stop sharing, and come back to talk between us about some of these issues. So if we work down these lists, this list, Richard, can I start with asking you about some of these safety concerns that we heard both the nurses and the doctors talking about? Yeah, I guess that there are, um, there are those safety concerns. So is the procedure itself safe? Uh, the other thing that I think it would be quite good to uh, unpack are things like the indemnity. So if you've got a negative test, and subsequently problems happen down the line, is that going to be an issue? So in terms of indemnity, what do you think both GPs and nurses would need to um, work out to implement this? Would it be a practice indemnity, for instance, or would it be personal indemnity as well? And I, what, sort of, what sort of procedures would we need to get lined up for implementation? I think we would just have to have that reassurance that actually if you have a negative test, uh, unless there is a change in the clinical scenario, that actually we're not obligated to go on to do a gastroscopy. Yeah. So I've been talking to some um, members of, um, well, some community uh, members who talked about would they, for instance, have open access if they had been buying over-the-counter um, antacids and they heard that uh, um, a local 
uh, practice was delivering the test, might they be able to just make their own appointment, even if they weren't a member of the practice? And what might the implications be of asking for that? How close do you think we are to those sorts of um, approaches being available in primary care? Yeah, I think I mean, it's quite interesting. So there are some trials going on, for instance, with uh, breast referrals that ladies who find a lump in their breasts, whether they can um, essentially self-refer. So I think we are maybe on the cusp of things being done slightly differently, where the GP doesn't necessarily have to be at the hub of the wheel for all clinical scenarios. So actually, I think there may be a loosening in the months and years ahead where patients are able to access uh, investigations and diagnostics. So that, that is a distinct possibility. And I guess this might be one such area where if someone's repeatedly going to the pharmacy and getting their antacids, their gaviscon or whatever, if the pharmacist is alerted to it, they could then say, well, have you considered actually having one of these tests, which is available at your local clinic or whatever. Or even at the pharmacy. Or even the pharmacy, absolutely. Yeah. And I think as we move towards the more collaborative working, which we're seeing uh, with the PCN formation. And one of the things that I think is quite exciting that maybe one of the offshoots of the COVID season is that it has forced us to work more collaboratively and think of being more uh, sort of together with our neighboring practices. And as we heard in your presentation, that the numbers are such that you probably need one or two skilled nurses, trained nurses who could provide a service for maybe three or four practices so that they are skilled at doing the procedure and the sort of the, the voice patter that is needed to take a patient through the uh, investigation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then, I mean, you, you a little while ago mentioned about liability. There is that whole area, isn't there, of, of how do we get um, results back to GPs who ultimately would bear the responsibility of referral if someone was found to have a positive cytosponge sponge test? Yeah, although I guess you could put in, in place the structure that you're getting in some of the referral pathways where you go straight to test, uh, which would then, an abnormal result could be routed directly through to the local gastroenterology department so that they could reach out to the patient directly. So one could design a pathway where that burden of clinical responsibility could actually be channeled in a different way and probably a more appropriate way. Yeah, no, that's great. OK, let's move on to some of those um, quotes we had about concerns about patient engagement, particularly when this was about a potential um, investigative test for cancer. So, of course, it isn't. We know that the cytosponge sponge is about um, detecting Barrett's esophagus and that this is just a it's a risk factor, albeit the, probably the most significant risk factor for um, esophageal cancer. But we heard one of those GPs then talking about, well, you know, people don't really like doing the fit test and that's just dipping something in their poo. How would we engage, do you think, better with people when this is, although it's not like having an endoscopy, it is still actually swallowing a sponge and having that removed again? Yeah, and I guess it's if you're if the patient is getting to the stage where they might be being considered for an investigation anyway, if the choice was the site of sponge swallowing a capsule in a familiar surroundings with nurses you might know, or going into your local hospital for an endoscopy, actually one against the other, I think I might sidle with the uh, site of sponge mm. uh, but, and not have ever having had a gastroscopy personally, but it, I'm not sure it's something I'd be queuing up for. Um, whereas the, the size of sponge, I think, uh, sounds as though it's probably more acceptable even than a gastroscopy. Yeah. We also know that a lot of patients are <laughs> very concerned about um, stepping foot in hospital um, during the pandemic. And indeed, even stepping foot in, in primary care right now, even though we're trying to give out the messages that primary care is open for everyone, has been and will be. Do you think this has got any impact on potential implementation of, of the site sponge? Yeah, I, and I think we are getting used to the idea of having things being delivered more locally uh, as we move to these, uh, the possibility of community diagnostic centres is being raised at the moment uh, and working alongside the rapid diagnostic centres. So I think we are looking, again, we are at the beginning of a change of how we do things. And it's amazing how the sort of the wheel comes around and how uh, those of us who are slightly uh, 
thinner thatched and longer toothed uh, that actually we're familiar with having local investigations and then they were all centralized over the last sort of 10 15 years and now we're looking to more localization again so my I think first general practice was was alongside a community hospital so i completely share that where we ran all our all our tests as well so yes i think we probably have come a full circle yeah yeah and i think patients like that local that combination of a, a local service provision but still has expert oversight yes absolutely so I'm going to move you on and think, therefore, we've been pretty positive so far. Let's think about this funding implication, because we heard uh, GPs particularly being concerned about the financial cost to them of delivering a service such as this, but also the nurses talking a great deal about how they um, would put aside the time to do cytosponge clinics, maybe um, the whole burden on what already feels a very full creaking at the seams primary care service that we have at the moment. Yeah, and I think the what this COVID season has really shown is how amazing primary care is and how it rises to the challenge, but if it's adequately funded as well. And I think we've seen with COVID that if the training is put in place and the motivation is there to train, and uh, having recently just come from a vaccination clinic armed with my 22 certificates of competence yeah. uh, it shows that things can be achieved if the motivation is there and I think fundamentally we're all there to make a difference to our patients and if we can adopt a pathway of investigation that is going to be diagnosing cancer earlier then that ticks a lot of boxes. Yeah I couldn't agree more everything you said. So let's think about the logistics then. And we, we got some very useful feedback in um, from some of those um, interviewees around the way we might organize ourselves, that we already have special clinics um, that the nurses run, doctors run, or maybe around chronic disease like, like diabetes, but also around, for instance, cervical um, cancer screening. What are your thoughts on, on that? And, and with this um, thinking about cytosponge? Yeah, and the, all the portents suggest that uh, working at scale is becoming the sort of the mantra of the day and certainly of the uh, months and years to come. Uh, certainly central funding is encouraging us all to get on better and better with our colleagues and our neighbours. And I think the, the structure of the PCN, if that becomes coterminous with a community diagnostic hub, uh, this just lends itself to fall into that structure. So I can see this uh, as this potentially is rolled out, it becomes a very exciting programme where, as we were just mentioning, you get a local delivery of an investigation with specialist and consultant oversight, but actually the GP is involved in that. And again, those of us who've been around a bit longer, the idea of actually being involved where we are hands on is actually quite exciting. Uh, because we're very much part of making a difference to our patients where they are. I was interested that um, during the trial, I, I know it was the way the trial was set up, but GPs were relatively apart, set apart from the delivery of the test itself. And so they, um, you know, they watched and they listened and they listened to their patients, and they listened to the nurses. But there certainly did seem to be a bit of an appetite to... Um, to be more involved too. So, so that reflects that. So I think that gets us to the, the final area I wanted to just discuss with you. And it's this whole area of gaining a skill and then maintaining your competencies. I remember very well when um, I used to fit smears, I was the only female GP in one practice I worked in. So I had a regular smear list, a, a coil list every week. And, um, and then, but it was difficult to keep your competencies up. And sometimes you might fit 20 or 30 cars a year and another year, just five. And I could see as we get in, you know, if this was to be implemented, that we might be in a similar position with the CITUS fund. It might be quite difficult to keep the competencies up. Have you any thoughts on this? Yeah, and I think what we will see within the PCN structures is we will get a PCN champion in all sorts of different clinical areas and uh, either through choice or necessity or just serendipity you will end up with a PCN maybe with 50,000 patients and maybe 15 to 20 GPs and you will get one of those who becomes the sort of the 
gastroenterology champion who oversees the service and will be very enthused and enthusiastic about it and will then oversee the nurses who actually implement the service. And I remember in previous decades, uh, people kicking back against that a bit about not wanting to be semi-specialized in primary care. Do you think it, that there will still be the role? I mean, what we pride ourselves on as GPs is our role as a generalist. Yeah, and, and speaking as a, as a cancer champion, I would say that almost the perfect combination is to be a generalist with a specialist interest in something. Yeah. And I think that gives you the experience of the breadth of experience, but also an area where relatively you become more expert in it and where you can support your colleagues. And I think to a certain extent, we've always done that. If you look at uh, group practice and you look at uh, the members of the team, uh, each person ends up leading something. And as you mentioned, very often the, the female GP ends up as the coil and women's health specialist, sort of subspecialist. Um, and likewise, if you're a male GP in a, uh, that what may be a predominantly female lineup, you end up as the urology and male health specialist. Yeah. So I, th I think those sort of things tend to evolve and actually become quite exciting. Excellent. Well, it's been an interesting discussion. Is there anything else that we haven't mentioned or covered? I just, yeah, I just think it's a very exciting program, exciting project. And I think it just demonstrates how uh, with the advance of science and medical research, how we're able to bring things back to being close to the patient. And actually, we become more involved in actually the delivery of diagnostics and delivery of care which I see to be fantastic and a, a great opportunity for all of us. And I hold this up as something of a, of a model for many other diagnostic approaches that we are trying to increase either access to from primary care or indeed delivery in the community. So great. Well, thank you so much, Richard. It's been great to have this conversation. Yeah, really good to join you uh, to, uh, to talk yeah. these through an exciting programme. Thanks. Bye. Bye.